Like mm -hmm. I will crack up with the voices. Like it's like I'll remember a scenario that happened and then we just go through it and I'm laughing hysterically. So like, yeah, that it, I do sometimes have a great time, but mm -hmm. I'd rather not have them at all. Michelle Hammer started hearing voices in high school, has been hospitalized at least three times, and is now not just living with schizophrenia, but proudly claiming schizophrenic.nyc, and has a clothing brand with the mission of reducing stigma by starting conversations about mental health. So on today's episode, the three moms chat with Michelle, talk about her voices, her treatment, her mission, and about a homelessness initiative in New York City that has its supporters and its questioners. Welcome to our podcast, Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. From the place where schizophrenia and real life collide. East Coast, West Coast, Middle America. With Miriam Feldman, Mindy Greiling, and Randy Kay. Finally, a place to talk about the truth. Welcome, welcome to episode 59. We are so excited about our guest today. We're going to dive right in. The title of today's episode is Schizophrenic NYC, Define Normal, Defy Stigma, and Talk About Homelessness. And I'm going to bring it right over to Mimi because Mimi, you've been chatting with our guest and I'm going to let you introduce her and we'll get going. Okay, well, I first came across Michelle really a couple of years ago in one of my manic uh, internet sweeps trying to find the thing that was going to pull Nick out of his shell and back into our world. And I was quite taken with her merchandise and everything that she's doing, which we'll talk about. And I reached out to her then and she's very kind to answer me. And we talked for a while it was sort of a pointless thing. I was really trying to ask her, like, how can I save Nick? Which she didn't know how to do, of course. <laughs> but um, but she was very gracious and nice. And now that we're back and we're doing this, I just wanted to bring her on to talk about this stuff. So Michelle Hammer is a schizophrenia activist and spends her time passionately fighting stigma. She's a New York City native. Um, she was diagnosed with schizophrenia at 22 after a misdiagnosis of bipolar at 18. At 27, Michelle decided to use her artistic talents and fearless personality to do something that would benefit the mental health community. In May of 2015, she founded a mental health focused clothing line, clothing brand, schizophrenic.nyc. It's a clothing brand with the mission of reducing stigma by starting conversations about mental health. And um, I think we should just start with that. Um, that's who she is and what she does. And we'd like to hear about that. So Michelle, just off the bat, what's the thing that you would most want our audience to know about what you're doing? About what I'm doing, what they, what, what I about, want myself. People, about myself. Yeah. Uh, that, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> well, uh, what I, I, that's a hard question. I All guess. Right, I prepped you. <laughs> well, we can let me, back. let me rephrase it a little bit okay. because we, we do want to hear your story, but if we were to say, what do you most want us to come away with from hearing your story? And then we'll hear the story. I, I guess I just want people to understand that, you know, if you get diagnosed with schizophrenia, your life is not over. I like to say that it was the best thing that ever happened to me because then I could be treated for the correct illness. That's awesome. So can okay. you give us a little bit of background about your story, a little bit about your road? Yeah, sure. So um, I think like things started happening mostly when I was in high school, I suffered for a lot of like a lot of like negative symptoms. I wasn't talking a lot. I wasn't speaking and I was very paranoid. My mom tried to get me help, but because I was so paranoid at everything she did, I thought she was trying to hurt me or sabotage me in some way. So when I go to college, I think, you know, my mom's gone. I have no, she's not sabotaging me anymore. Every, you know, I go for a while, things are good. And then all of a sudden, I think that my roommate is trying to hurt me or sabotage me. And that was when it just kind of like, it just 
the click in my head. Oh no, it was me the whole time, you know? So that's when I decided to go to the, you know, the school health center to try to get some sort of help. And within about 15 minutes, this guy went through a checklist and told me that I was bipolar and handed me a pamphlet with some crying girl on the cover. Yeah. So that's really helpful. Right. And mm-hmm. then he sends me to the school, school psychologist who puts me on medication and doesn't tell me any side effects, doesn't tell me anything about it. Just take this, these medicines. And then I remember going to her the next week and she didn't even remember that she had given me, any, me a prescription at all. So things didn't go so well, you can imagine, because I'm, I'm not bipolar. So those meds didn't work for me. And throughout college, I ended up in the psych ward three separate times. So, you know, that was fun. Yeah, yeah, you can imagine. So after college, I no longer saw like, well, I ended up seeing another doctor in town. So I, he finally gave me a medication where I took this medication. And then finally, like the paranoia was gone. All of it was just gone. And I was just thinking, is this how like regular people feel? Like I've never felt so good. Cause like, and then I, I, I took it. It's like, I tried to think of all of the things that bothered me so much and that just drove me crazy and it didn't bother me anymore. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, this is life. Like, is this what life is supposed to be like? It was amazing. But then wow. I graduate college. I'm no longer seeing that doctor. I'm not on that medication. And I told my mom, you know, I need to go see a doctor. She's like, oh, I found you a great therapist with decades of experience. Now, when you say that, you have to think about a little bit of who that person's going to be. When they have decades of experience and you're a 22 year old girl, that means you're seeing a therapist who's extremely, extremely old. That's what it means. (laughs) As, as are we, but that's okay. I know. I know. I get, I understand that, but I was 22 (laughs) and this woman was at least probably 70 years old and I'm 22. So it's like, and I think she was English also. So it's very hard for me to relate to this woman. And like, she even said to me the strangest thing. She said, you're not acting like a woman of your attractiveness should be acting like. And I was just like, what in the world lady? Like, you're not acting like a woman who charges so much should be acting like, like, what are you talking about? (laughs) But basically my whole thing with her was to try to get, go to a psychiatrist because I don't like therapy that much anyway. Like, I don't just want to like, just talk about things all the time. Like I just wanted to be medicated and just like, you know, just blankly do it, whatever. So she sends me to the psychiatrist that was in that office. And I've never had a more blunt discussion with a man. And (laughs) That's why it worked because I'm very New York. Like I, people like to say, you know, you beat around the bush. I'm that person with the lawnmower that just mows down the bush. Like that's how it goes. <laughs> and that's why me and this guy got along because there was asking me some questions and I was like, I'm not going to answer that. And he was like, you paid $600 for this session. You're going to answer these questions. And I was like, <laughs> I like this guy. I like him. It's very New York. I'm a New Yorker too. So I totally get right? you. Okay. Right. So like that was like how I could man it. I liked him. And I've been seeing this guy since I was 22 to however old I am now, I'm not even going to say but I'm older now, maybe over 10 years. Maybe. I'm not going to say, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> but like with him, we, I mean, we worked on many different medications, worked with different things. You know, I've been seeing him for so long, but like we finally got to that combination that, that works. And I- just, So you never I, had any experience of um, anosognosia or not understanding or knowing that you were sick? Well, in, in college, well, in high school, I didn't believe I was sick. I thought I was right. You know, I'm not paranoid. I'm right. You know, people are assholes and everyone does hate me. I'm right. You know, things like that. Or like in college, I was like, I'm not bipolar. I'm, you know, I have no mental illness. I just like running around all the time. I, I, I like this playing like this. I, I like, you know, I don't have mental illness. I don't need medication. Like I was like, I was in the psych ward and the next week, I, like week, I was like, let's go out to the bar. And, and our, my friends were like, Michelle, like, let's like, wait, wait, like, you know, don't go out again. And they're like, what are we waiting for? Why do I have to wait? You know, things like that. Mm. Like, I didn't believe I was mentally ill for a long time, but. Can I ask you a question that I've never been able to ask my son? Uh, Yeah. Yes. So I think, you know, who we are, we're three moms. We each have sons with schizophrenia, which is why I especially like to talk with women who are diagnosed with schizophrenia because it, it's be it's outside of uh, we we've interviewed a few people outside of my experience as the mother of a son um my our sons all had got symptomatic 
Well, maybe when you did, but it was clearer sooner than 22. I know they didn't really get to college. But I would like to ask you, if you're willing to answer it, what that felt like to you in high school, a young girl suddenly suddenly hearing voices or suddenly having thoughts. I, I don't know if you knew they were voices. Like, how do you know they're voices if that's the way you've always thought? So can you share what it felt like to you? Was it scary? Yeah. Was it... You, you know, before you went into low, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Did a voice like, come out of the blue or had you always heard it and they got louder? Can you describe that at all? It's weird because I didn't think it was a voice. I thought everybody had this in their head. And it was just after everything I said, that was really stupid. Why did you say that? After everything I did, that was really dumb. Why did you do that? Or at night before I was trying to fall asleep, I would just cry and cry because something in my head was telling me when you said that today, you were so dumb. When you did that, you were dumb. Everybody thinks that you're so stupid. Everything you say is so dumb. You shouldn't talk anymore. Don't even try to talk to people. Everybody hates you anyway. And it was just so degrading all the time. It was so mean to me all the time. But I thought if I would just say the right things, do the right things, act the right way, then I would be okay. But I didn't know that this voice in my head wasn't something that other people didn't have. I thought everybody had this and it was just so mean to me because I was such a terrible person. That brings me to a question, which mm -hmm. is, you know, I don't know specifically the answer for um, Mindy and Randy. I think they're probably a little, I, I think Mindy's son is a little more open with her, but my son will not even acknowledge or talk about. And I wonder so much, what are those voices? And every time I talk to somebody who can talk about it, they're always awful. I mean, are they, or is that, that those voices, are they ever nice or it's just always a bad thing. Well, I mean, they used to be kind of always a bad thing, but now mm -hmm. that like I'm on medicine, but I'm not like, you know, zombie medicine, like mm -hmm. I will crack up with the voices. Like, it's like, I'll remember a scenario that happened and then we just go through it and I'm laughing hysterically. So like, yeah, that it, I do sometimes have a great time, but mm -hmm. I'd rather not have them at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when you started on medicine, did they gradually get to the point where you can laugh with them or was it more abrupt when you started your medication? You know, I'm not sure because actually I, there's this story that I have. I was in like 11th grade in physics class and I was in the back of the classroom and I was just laughing and laughing and laughing at nothing. And I remember this girl, she turned around and she was just like, are you okay? And I was like, oh yeah. And she's like, what are you laughing at? And I was like, oh, I don't know. But I was laughing so hysterically that I was had tears in my eyes. So that happened to me in 11th grade before any diagnosis, before any medication. My son laughs too. Yeah. He won't ever acknowledge it, but he'll, he'll sit and laugh, which actually warms my heart. Makes me think maybe it's not always awful. So, um, so you got out of college and you entered into your life and you have a good therapist now or a good doctor who gets your medication right. When and why did you start Schizophrenic New York City? Well, yes. So I moved to New York City and I'm like, had my graphic design degree and everything. And I was doing graphic and web design and some coding. And in about five years, I had about like 12 to 15 jobs and I was fired from every single one of them. I am great at interviewing. I can get a job. I can do design, everything like that. It's just every single other part of a job I can't do. It's the sitting behind the desk for eight hours a day. It's the cognitive skills of my boss telling me something to do and I don't understand it. And it's dealing with all the people. It's the nighttime pill that makes it hard for me to wake up in the morning and be on time. It's like the ADD of just like, I'm trapped here. I'm trapped at this desk all day. Like that's also one thing that colleges don't prepare you for. You know, you go to college, you go to class or you'll skip class or you'll hang out, you go in sweatpants, you know, they don't tell, teach you how to just sit behind a desk for eight hours a day. Cause like professors don't have that job. Professors have a yeah. great job. You know, <laughs> they don't teach you that like being a professor is an awesome job. <laughs> 
You know, they don't teach you. Yeah, you have to dress up. You can't wear your sweatpants and sweatshirts, but you have to dress up and sit behind a desk for eight hours a day doing the job that we're teaching you how to do as we're chilling because we're professors because we're awesome. Like, it's not easy to do. Like, working is not easy, especially when you have schizophrenia. And I remember at one job, I guess I was just like totally dissociated, like talking to people. My boss and another person came over and they were like, are you on the phone? And I was like, no. And they're like, who are you talking to? And I was like, nobody. They're like, well, it looks like you're talking to somebody. And I was like, no, nobody, just just nothing. I was just doing nothing. So it's like sometimes things are hard to explain, but like it's also like just some, like if I had to like read a whole list of things I had to do, I would just get really confused on things. I don't know. I don't know exactly why I always screwed up, but I always screwed up and I always got fired for all little different things, but they all kind of measured up for the same thing. And then now, I was like, do people you know, what? know when you go get your job, do people know that you have schizophrenia or you don't talk about it? I, I, I don't tell them. I t- one place I told HR and it's actually at that place when I was brought into a meeting and he brought up that situation, I just turned to HR and I said, I think what you read in that letter explains that. And she just told him that he had to drop it and he brought it up again. And he just, and the HR was like, you have to drop it. And with uh, no explanation to him. Since that you're was in New York place. City. Yeah. Excuse me. Since you're in New York, New York City, um, I always hear about Fountain House. And, and one of the things that clubhouses do so well is help people get jobs. But more importantly, after they get them, help them keep them, you know, for all the things that you're talking about. Do you have any, do you ever go to Fountain House or do you know anybody that has been helped with these kinds of employment issues with them? Yes, uh, I am a member of Fountain House. I really do like Fountain House. The thing is with Fountain House jobs, they don't set you up with like, if I wanted a graphic design job, they're not going to like set me up with that job. They set you up with like different jobs, like handing out the mail or like at a place or like delivering like meals on wheels, things like that. And mm-hmm. it, it, you make, they only give you jobs that will make you earn like $200 a week, which is not bad, but, um, you know, like I, cause I had so many jobs. I was so well-rounded in graphic and web design in so many different fields. So that's why I was able to build my own website and start my own clothing line because I had so much industry experience. So tell us about that. Tell us about what, what, what your intent was with the business. Yeah. I, I, you know, looking around New York city, you see homeless people with mental illness all the time. And you know, there's one in five New Yorkers has a mental health issue. So like, you know, if, if the, what's with all the stigma, if it's so common. So I wanted to like, just start a, some sort of awareness. Like I started a clothing line with just like really just bold slogans that would just make people just aware about mental health in, in New York city. And can you say some of them for our listeners? Yeah. There's don't be paranoid. You look great. It's not a delusion. You are incredible Define normal. I'm mentally ill and I don't kill. And it's just to be, just bring awareness to mental health in New York city. And I have a pop-up shop. I usually pop up in front of the fountain house gallery. I have to talk to them on in a few days, just to double make sure on that, whatever. But, um, it, it's just like when people approach my pop-up shop, it's either they tell me that like they have a mental illness, a friend of theirs has a mental illness or a family member does. So if it's like, you know, so common, what is with all the stigma? It just doesn't make any sense to me. So it's just about getting people to have that conversation because the more conversations we have about mental health, the less stigma there will be. And I think since I've started my business to now, the conversations have grown exponentially. And it's so much, people are so much more open now than they were when I first started. I love that, that, that your, um, that your slogans have a sense of humor to them Yes, because that is to me, you know, I'm, I wear many hats, but, uh, you know, humor is a huge part of everything that I do. And so to me, when someone can joke kindly and mutually, with somebody about something that is like the ultimate acceptance. So I, I, I love your slogans. And I just want to throw in that we, we have done in case you're listening and you don't know what Fountain House is, I encourage you to do a search on our episodes. We did a whole interview uh, about clubhouses and specifically Fountain House. So I want you to look at that as well. And we will be doing a show at some point. We have not planned it yet, so don't hold me to it. But we do plan a show about employment and whether to disclose or not, because I I, I totally hear you. My son 
I will share that he just lost a job. He has never disclosed. He has never disclosed. And he will get the job when he's stable on medication. And then if during the job he gets unstable on medication or the medication stops working, he can look like you look like you're talking on the phone. He will look spaced out or he will look like he doesn't care or he will look like he's unproductive, even though he's trying his best. And so I'm sure disclosing would help him, but he doesn't believe he has schizophrenia. So that is what, you know, many without the acceptance slash awareness of it with anosognosia, which if you don't know what that is, we've done many shows on that as well. It's a medical lack of awareness that you have schizophrenia. So uh, I, it just brings to mind that we should do a show on disclosure and whether to do it or not. And your story has been really interesting and I love what you're doing. So how is the business doing? Um, it, it, it's doing, it's doing well. I mean, everything can always be better. Of course. I mean, you know, if anyone listening wants to make, make some orders, that'd be great. Schizophrenic that NYC. Give us the website. Schizophrenic NYC. Schizophrenic dot NYC. Dot NYC. Cause there's no dot com. There's it's okay. Got it. Schizophrenic dot NYC. And of course that link will be in the show notes. Yes. Yeah. But you know, it's going well. I get good responses. Sometimes I get some weird responses. Some, I mean, sometimes people think that I'm making fun of people when I'm not. You never know. You never know who's going to walk down the street. You never know. So do you ever get people who like really take issue with it or are offended by it? Oh, yes, of course. Yeah. How of course. do you deal with that? <laughs> um, you know, sometimes I try to explain what it is, but I usually don't get the chance. I just get yelled at as they walk by. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do you think that's because you look like you're doing so well? You know, I always think we can joke about mental illness because we're family members, you know, or Jim, my son can joke about mental illness because he has schizophrenia, but, um, but we don't expect other people to do that. So maybe they mistake you for a, a very, very normal person and that and therefore you don't get the pass that you would if you looked obviously I I, I pro- probably yeah. probably I mean whenever like like a, a therapist or a psychiatrist come by and they're like oh you you have schizophrenia they're like what what medication are you on <laughs> they always ask that's me what that. I asked you <laughs> yeah they always ask me that all the you know, time. It, it's interesting, Michelle, I don't know what medication you're on mm-hmm. but I do know that one of the things I read when my son was first I diagnosed was um, the day the voices stopped, which is a memoir by a man who has passed since passed away. But he talks about careening from uh, successful political PR careers to being homeless on the streets, which will bring us to our next topic in a moment and back and forth and back and forth. And for him, the medication that works. And that's the thing to find the medication that works for you. Yes. For him, it was Clozerel, which we've talked about before on the show. And we have many episodes you can check on that. And he depicted in his book and it just opened my eyes. He said, suddenly the voices stopped. I didn't have the chatter going on. And I know you just said, gee, is this how regular people live? For him, he said, I was lonely. No. Yeah. And I had to go and hide in my bathroom for three days. I knew it was what I needed to do, but I had to make that transition. And so it it opened my eyes as the mother of someone with schizophrenia that when they're your constant companions, it might be difficult to navigate life without somebody to laugh with or someone to tell you it's not your fault but I'm sure it's great to not hear the bad things. So yeah. that was just something that it reminded me of. But when it works, and we all want better medications, but it, when they're as good as they get and it begins to give you a life that understanding what you're still dealing with, you're, you know, nobody would say, oh, what a shame. She's lost her life. You're doing great, at least as far as we can see. So, and and I love what you're doing. Um so thank you. That was just not a question. That was a, a comment. I just wanted to put in um, to honor the person who wrote that book. His name is Ken Steele, and he is from New York City. And I do believe he went to Fountain House, but he preceded you, Michelle. Gotcha. Okay. Well, yeah. now that we touched on homelessness, let's talk about that a bit, because we we wanted to ask you about this. Not that 
you're the spokesperson for everybody in New York City, but we wanted to talk to you and this specifically relates to New York City. And so we thought it would be interesting. Um, this, um, this new move that Mayor Adams has done to, it's really sort of an edict he put out, or it's not really anything particularly you know, in, in law, but that he's going to start, that they're going to start picking up people who are on the street who are obviously have serious mental illness and need medical treatment and get them to hospitals and get them treated. And it's a controversial thing. Um, I know a lot of friends of mine who are people who have mental illnesses themselves do not like it. I know people who do. So what I thought we would do is just off the bat, just tell you really in a, a line or two where we're each of us are at and then hear what you think about the whole thing. Okay. You know, my position about it is as a mom, anything that's going to get my kid closer to treatment and the medication he needs is fine with me. And um, I'm uh, th that my eye is on that ball. And that seems, you know, to me, that's all that counts. And so from my perspective, this is a good step in a decent direction. I know that it has inherent problems, but anything that gets people to treatment, I am pro. So that's my attitude about it. Randy? Okay, so we we agreed to just do two or three lines about how we feel. So um, I will add to that that I spent many years hearing your son can't have treatment, he's not sick enough. When he was wandering the street all night, scaring the neighbors, uh, talking to trees, uh, lose, gaining and losing seven jobs. This was without medication. Um, you know, things that really put his life in danger and made his family frightened. And I was told constantly, well, he's not sick enough. He's not sick enough. So uh, I applaud getting them to treatment without having to witness violence or brandishing a gun or any of the things, you know, definite harm to themselves or others. However, I'm totally aware that the problem is more than just getting them in. The problem is you need to have a space. You need to have a good, we need beds. And then what happens after they're in the hospital? If there's no system to continue treatment, if it's just going to be a revolving door, then all they're getting is a few days off the street and they're kicked out again. So that's my two cents. Mindy? So I, I, my perspective is that the press and my daughter, Michelle, is a journalist. So I normally rave about the press, but my perspective is that the, including the New York Times, you know, the press has been so awful because it's my understanding that Mayor Adams is not, he didn't change as Mimi said, he changed no laws. He's just trying to not have people just be dangerous to themselves or others, but also use the gravely disabled part of the um, of the criteria. So just like Mimi and Randy, as a mother, I like that criteria to be used and to getting help when people's brains are on fire and de you know deteriorating because of their illness is really important to me. When you answer, Michelle, I'd be interested because I have actually haven't heard, and maybe I'm just not reading enough, but how many people actually have with all this who has going on, you know, how, are they actually picking anybody up or or not? Well, actually, I don't even know if they've started this, but my opinion on this whole thing, like, yes, it does sound like a great idea, but actually putting it into mm -hmm. practice, it, it's not going to work because if you see someone having some sort of psychotic episode and then you you bring a police officer in the mix, that's when usually people get killed. You know, when they say you're having a that's like that's how they had that started the 988 number or things like that. They have to have a social worker come when there's a psychotic thing happening. So why would they put that into the mix? And now instead of that happening, they're putting cops now a, coming when there's a psychotic episode to then take people, put them into a psych ward and they're going to magically help them and then put them where? 
Like, like I said before, I've been to the psych ward three times and not one of those times was I diagnosed with schizophrenia and given any medications. So how come, how is it possible that these people taken off the street unwillingly, right, are going to be put into a psych ward, get magically fixed and then put where? I've seen homeless people walking down the street in hospital scrubs many, many times. Because why? They were probably unwillingly put into the hospital, were trying to get help, had no insurance, and then they're like, we don't know what to do with you. Bye. You know, what's, what's, how is this going to improve anyone? I don't see how this could possibly work. I think Mayor Adams just put this into like the idea of people's heads, like here, I'm going to do this. And then he wants rich people to like him because they're like, oh, we don't like these crazy homeless people. We don't like them. Oh, let me do something to try to make them happy. But this you is know, just going to lead to death. I agree with you, Michelle. I think that's a big component of it is that that's what I question about the whole thing. I mean, I support it, but I still think that the the motivation is dubious because I don't think it's really about helping the people. I think there's a huge outcry in New York City right now about all the crime on the subways and they want to say that it's all mentally ill people. And I think he's pandering. I do. I agree yeah. with you. Them. There was already um, a thing that they said they were going to put social workers in the subways to help with the homeless people and everything. I have not seen one social worker in the subway, and they've been saying this for a year. What and that is a problem. Them? That's definitely a problem. That's one thing that um, that I thought they were going to do from what I read, that it, it wasn't just all police officers. They were going to try to embed social workers. And so the devil is always in the details, you know, as a family member, I would not, we try to call the police last, you know, we really, really want a crisis team or a social worker or somebody else besides the police. But unfortunately, because we don't um, intervene early enough, then if they are dangerous, those people don't come up unless there's a police. So it's, it's, it's a whole problem when we don't have capacity. We don't, I mean, the whole mental health system is so sparse and depleted that it's when you try to it's like whack-a-mole you try to fix something but if all the other things aren't fixed then um, nothing works so that is a problem right Michelle what is your opinion about involuntary hospitalization in general I mean I think it depends what you what you really did you know do you really deserve to be there like you know like, did you just say something or did you do something? Are you dangerous? Things like that. You know, if, you know, cause like I never wanted to go to the hospital when I went, I never liked it, but did I need to go? I mean, I can argue back and forth for a very long time. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of things like that. I kind of like, I don't really have the best answer, but like, I don't think that just picking up people off the street is really going to help them in any way. And if there's people that are on the fence about just going to the psych ward, maybe they were not going to have a bed for them. Or if they don't really want to go, but they have to go, the psych ward is then full of homeless, crazy people that aren't even helping themselves. They're never going to want to go to the psych ward ever again. If those are the people who are in the psych ward. They'd rather be on the street in that case. It's, it's, you know, it's funny. I thought we were all going to be so far apart on this issue, and I don't think we are. It, it's one of these things of putting a Band-Aid over here, or like Mindy said, whack-a-mole. Um, you know, I've been reading about the initiative, and it sounds good on paper, directing police and city medics to be more assertive, getting severely mentally ill people off the streets and subways and into treatment even if that means involuntary hospitalization of some people who refuse care. And that sounds like a good first step. What I'm not hearing in any of this is what comes after that. Well, and if and, they don't well, want medication. One thing they did do. Right. One thing they did do, it, which I think is a really good thing, it's a start anyway, is, you know, Michelle, you mentioned people get in the hospital and then they're out in a flash. They, they added those 50 beds so that could be, I can't remember, if it was three months or four months, but there, there could be long-term help for people that actually do get um, evaluated and need the hospital. So I thought that was a start. You have to start I somewhere. I want to get back to something that Michelle said that I think is very interesting is, you know, yeah. most people, when we're sick or we hurt ourselves, we want to get to the hospital. Michelle said, nobody wants to go to the psych ward. It's like, it's a punishment. It's like, it's, the last thing you want. And so here you have an illness 
that needs treatment. And the last thing that people with illness want to do is go there. Is that a correct? Um, In my opinion, I know people that have had good experiences. It's not that I was treated badly. It's that I thought it was just the most boring place in the world. And I didn't understand how boring the tears out of me was trying to help me at all. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, um, you know, another thing I wanted to ask you about in this vein is um, Harvey Rosenthal, who's the chief, chief executive of the New York Association of Psychiatric Rehabilitation Services. And he's a big critic of um, involuntary confinement. And he says, the mayor talked about, quote, trauma-informed approach, but coercion is in itself traumatic. What do you think about that? I, yeah, coer yeah, people are telling you to go when you don't want to go and they're convincing you to go. Yeah, okay, they, they convinced you to go, but then you're alone there. You've gone, the people that convinced you to go, they stayed in their lives doing their thing, but you are now stuck in the psych ward. Okay, I'm now convinced to be here and now I'm here. What am I doing? What's the next thing? What's the next step? So it's what happens after. I yeah. mean, I know my son's been hospitalized 10 times and- He's had good care there. So it has made a difference for him. It has made a good difference for him, even though he That's didn't great. want to go while he was there. It was a good program. And so we have done, and in case you're new to our podcast, we're in our third season. And in season one, we did a lot of episodes with Lynn Nanos and, uh, and other ones, you know, about the system and the psychiatric social workers. We have, like many other podcasts, are, are, our sister and brother podcasts who are talking about this and you have a couple of podcasts, Michelle, I want to hear, I want to hear about those. So these, these issues, we can all learn about it so that we can all work together to fix it. There are many excellent suggestions out there. And I, you know, I think Mayor Adams is trying to make a good suggestion. I don't think it was thoroughly thought out. I think we can all agree on that. Right. Well, I will, there's just I will, no housing. Just there's, no there's no housing. There's no housing. There's no housing. And I, I just, like I said, I went to the psych ward three times. No one diagnosed me with schizophrenia. How, I just don't see how, I think it's going to be, people are going to be violently dragged off the street, put in the psych ward. And I don't, I just don't see how there's going to be a magical cure. I don't just don't wish there was one. I just don't see how that's going to work. I just, I can't see how that's going to help. And what I'm like, what if I the then I'm like, oh, I need to go to the psych ward. Things aren't good. And then either there's no bed or I'm in the psych ward with all of these people that were dragged off the street. Mm. Aren't my, aren't I going to be like, why am I here? I don't want to be here. Gotcha. Do you think that the important missing component is aftercare and housing? That aftercare. That's yeah. Like, but also what if you have medicine? How do I pay for my medicine? There's a lot wrong. Move on to housing or something. Um, I just want to say I actually do support the plan. I know that it's you know devils in the details with the implementing the mental health system is is not anywhere where it should be. But I actually applaud Mayor Adams for trying to do something that I haven't seen very many places. So we're going to have a program later with a man named Mark Rippey from California who died on the street. And, you know, I'm very sympathetic with that viewpoint. I know every state is different and New York's got better laws probably than California. But for somebody whose family is, you know, he was hit by a truck, had a broken hip, he was blind. I mean, he just kept getting sicker and sicker and finally he died. So I think that's the kind of person that Mayor Adams' plan is trying to do something about, not people who are health, you know, healthy in their illness. And so I just want to insert that. So yeah, I know it's not healthy. I'm, I'm very wants. sympathetic with, with the intent of the plan. And I hope, I don't think they're going to be rounding people up because there isn't capacity in the system. And I don't think anybody's even. I know, but I, I, I walk around, I, I see plenty of homeless people who look like they're they're talking to nobody or they're yelling or something. I think and they're still there, leave. probably. Yeah, I mean, and also there, a lot of that could just be confused with drug addicts who are on just a drug binge. I know this one woman who just loves to take her dress off and run around Washington Square Park screaming like that's one they'll round up. But she doesn't look like she has a psychiatric problem. She looks like she's on some really hard drugs. It's hard to tell the difference sometimes. Yeah. 
So Please, I Jill, can you tell us a little more about you and what you're doing? We'd like to hear about your podcast and just like what your plans are. Yeah. Because you're so dynamic and it's so impressive. And by the way, I was talking to another mom who's in our group with Dr. Leitman and Michelle knows Dr. Leitman because she's friends with Daniel. And she said she has a daughter, her daughter's in her early twenties and she just follows you like madly on, on social media and everything. Oh, really? That's cool. Awesome. And I think it's so great that somebody like you is out there for these younger kids. Cause I mean, they get so sick of listening to us. <laughs> so we are we're old we've had decades of experience <laughs> i'm guessing I was, the younger I was 22 at the time i was 22 i was 22 yeah it's okay it's all good you'll get there yeah you'll get there so, so yeah, yeah tell us about you and tell us about your podcast yeah. and a little more about schizophrenic.nyc so that and how people can get in touch with you if you want them to sure yeah well uh, i have a podcast with my friend gabe howard it's called a bipolar a schizophrenic and a podcast i'm i'm He's the bipolar Gabe and I'm the schizophrenic and uh, which together we have a podcast right now. It's on hiatus. We kind of just come out with like 10 episodes here, 10 episodes there. And we just kind of just talk about life or different topics from our different, you know, illness point of views, things like that. And also um, May 13th, I'm hosting a comedy show called Cracking Up, a crazy night of mental health comedy. And actually Dan Leitman is one of the comedians who will be there. So Come to New York, May 13th, 9.30 p.m. It's 21 plus. Don't worry. You guys you guys can get in, I think. You might have to show an <laughs> ID. Good. You have to show your ID. They won't believe you, I'm sure. And um, it's it's going to be a night of some crazy mental health fun. And it's because I got a grant from Janssen that they're sponsoring it. So that's really <laughs> awesome. Um, other things we're doing, uh, Schizophrenic NYC is, is going, going good going to work on popping up and uh, I got my website schizophrenic at NYC other things I'm doing is my TikTok also schizophrenic at NYC and my Instagram schizophrenic at NYC isn't that convenient that's so convenient so and so convenient. easy to find you I gotta follow you right now as soon as we as soon most as people done. are like so how do I spell schizophrenic <laughs> like, I love that I love that you're owning it that you're owning that phrase because you can but we can't you know what I'm saying? So I love that you're owning it. That's, um, that's, a. I'm, I really would love to bring my son to your comedy night. We'll see how that goes. And he's, I would love to see it. I follow Daniel Leitman on Instagram and he cracks me up. I laugh his, his in the jokes morning when thing I every day. I watch jokes. them every day. Every, he's so clever. I'm like, how does he come up with this? So let's let our listeners know who yeah. this is, Dr. Leitman. I would like I would like to know that too. How does he come up with them? I know. So Daniel, Daniel is the son of Dr. Leitman, who we have interviewed on the show and who is a strong advocate for correctly combining pharmaceuticals so the side effects are minimized and the good effects are maximized. And quite often that means Clozarel combined with the right combination. And his son, Daniel, is a comedian. Is that pretty much yeah. sum it up? And, and he, who has schizophrenia? He's a good comedian. He's a good comedian. A good comedian a good who comedian. also <laughs> has schizophrenia. So we're, we're running out of time. I think we uh, wanted to end with one big question. Um, actually can I back up? I have two more questions. One okay. is tell us about the support you have in your life besides Fountain House, your family, your friends, is there support or, and a great, you have a great doctor, but is there support around you other than that? Yeah. And then yeah, we'll yeah. just ask a summing up question. Yeah. I, I do have support from my partner, from my family, from my friends. I have like tons of support, which I realize that a lot of people don't have. So I realize that I'm actually really lucky. So, I mean, I call myself like a lucky schizophrenic and people are like, what are you talking about? I'm like, no, trust me. I, I am very lucky because if I didn't have all that support, like I, I don't know where I would be right now. So I, I, I realize that I'm an extremely lucky, lucky person to have that. Thank you. So I guess the, the, the last thing is just what, what's the main thing you'd like people to know? You kind of answered it at the beginning, but now you've told your story and we know more about you. Um, any like last words, anything we didn't ask you that you want us to know about schizophrenia and mental illness in our culture? 
Well, also, I, one thing I like to say is that like there, there's no worst illness. Like schizophrenia is not the worst illness. Like it's not the worst diagnosis you can have. Like there's, there's no like you know, like, a, like suffering Olympics. Like just because you get a schizophrenia diagnosis, you know, it's not like oh my god, I'm schizophrenic. Like it, you. It, there's like no, there's all a spectrum. So just because you have that schizophrenia diagnosis doesn't mean you're the craziest person. Like you could have no diagnosis and we'd be like way crazier than me, you know? <laughs> it's not the worst one. It's not. I like that. There's no, <laughs> there's no mental illness Olympics. Hmm. Yep. Well, I think that's a good, a good thought to, to end on because I think that a lot of our kids when they get that diagnosis, do feel like it's the worst words they've ever heard in their life. And I think more people like you and more people talking about it like we're doing here is going to change that. And I'm so grateful for you for getting out there and kicking ass like you are. We appreciate well, thank it. Thank you. I try, try to kick as much ass as possible. <laughs> well, you're a New Yorker. Yeah. This has been a delight. <laughs> thank you. Thank uh, you thanks. so much, Michelle. Thank you we for having me. You guys are so great and you're so old and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. There's truth in comedy. Comedy yes. is truth. But you know it's what? True. Just like what you it's said true. about there's no um there's no mental illness Olympics. My thing that I always say to people is people say to me, You're not old. And I'm like, Yeah, I'm old. Well, you know what is old a bad thing? I'm 67. That's not young. You it's know old. what? You're still alive. Exactly. Not everyone exactly makes it. Old. Not everyone makes it, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So it's yep. the same thing. We can we can define ourselves the way that we want to. And to me, saying I'm old is a compliment. I know I have to admit, I have to I dye my hair because I'm gray. There you go. Welcome you to go. the club. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you are in our club. All oh, right. This know. has been episode 59 <laughs> and we have a lot ahead for you. Thank you so much for, for subscribing and sharing and, and Michelle, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode of Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches with Randy Kay, Mindy Greiling and Miriam Feldman. To get in touch with us or to learn more about our books, please visit our websites at miriam-feldman.com, mindygreiling.com, or randyk.com.